Well, good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you to Woodstock Baptist Church, and we want to thank you for joining us in person and online. It is a great day to be together, and we're so glad that you've made the decision to be with us this morning on this first Sunday in the month of April. And it's a great day to be together worshiping our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And whether you're a familiar face or a first-time visitor, uh, Woodstock Baptist Church is a place where we can come together as a family, we can celebrate who God is, where we can grow, and where we can encounter the life-transforming power of God. And so we want to welcome you here this morning, and we want to make you aware of some of the ministry that's going to happen in the life of our church, so tune in to our video announcements at this time. Good morning and welcome. We're so glad you're able to join us this morning, whether it's online or in person. Here's what's happening this week at WBC. So we encourage you to check out your bulletin for all of our regular life groups and ministries that are happening this week. We will be selling flowers to fundraise for the youth mission trip to Niagara Falls this summer. Such sign-up sheets are available in the foyer and they're also online on our website. Please note that the deadline to order these flowers is May 1st. You can contact Pastor Keegan if you have any questions. As well, next Sunday, April 14th, we're gonna have a spaghetti lunch fundraiser for the youth mission trip to Niagara Falls. And you're all invited to join us in the gym. Uh, after the morning service, we're gonna have spaghetti, Caesar salad, garlic bread, and a yummy dessert. And cost is by donation, and all donations received will go toward the uh, financial needs of the youth trip. And if you have any questions, you can ask Pastor Pete. On April 16th at 10 a.m., the Young at Heart group will be having a brunch with all the fixings. There is no charge for this meal, but a donation box will be available if you wish to contribute. And so if you're over 50 years old and are young at heart, you are welcome to come, bring a friend, and enjoy this time of fellowship. We're excited to announce that we're going to be starting a new life group called Celebrate Recovery on Wednesday evenings. It's going to begin on April 17th at 7 p.m. in the youth room. It's going to be led by Ellen London and Steve and Julie Wagstaff. Living in a broken world, we all deal with life's hurts, hang-ups, and habits. And no one has the ability, nor should they attempt, uh, to face their hurts on their own. So Celebrate Recovery is a safe place to get honest about your pain, whether it's from addiction, abuse, depression, self-image issues, or other sins or hurts in your life. At Celebrate Recovery, we'll learn to walk in the freedom that we have through the power of Jesus Christ. And you're all welcome to participate. And if you have any questions, you can contact Ellen or the Wagstaffs or myself. And on Thursday, April 25th from 6.30 till 8 p.m., there will be a new eight-week life group for ladies. This is entitled, The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. This will be led by Kyla McClellan at her home. For more details, please contact Kyla or Corrine. We're also gonna be having another clothing giveaway on Saturday, April 27th from eight till noon here at WBC. And we're asking if you have any items that you would like to donate as you're going through your closets, uh, please drop them off here at the church and that can begin tomorrow, April the 8th. So we'll take whatever you'd like to donate. The youth will be going to OneCon this year from May 31st to June 1st. So if you're a youth in grades 6 to 12 and are interested in attending, please let Pastor Keegan know. We also want to let you know about a marriage conference that's happening in St. Andrews at the Algonquin Hotel um, on the weekend of April the 26th to the 28th, beginning Friday evening and going till Sunday at noon. And we're busy and it's just a time to get away with your spouse and just reconnect, reboot, uh, get renewed in your marriage. And there's these pamphlets out in the foyer that you can pick up if you want some more information. We also just wanna let you know that there is an early bird pricing uh, that goes until tomorrow, uh, Monday night, and you can save $100 if you're interested. And here's a little video that'll just tell you a little bit more about the weekend. We spend hours every day working on improving things. Our homes, our health, our minds, our careers, all good things, but shouldn't our marriages be on that list? What if all it took was one weekend? A Family Life Weekend Getaway Marriage Conference. 
It's uniquely designed to enrich your relationship, but it's more than just a conference. It's an experience, an experience for everyone. It's not just about sitting and listening. It's about doing, having conversations and working through projects together. It's about being in a safe place where you only have to share with your spouse, no one else. It's about leaving the busyness behind and taking time to focus on what really matters. It's about learning and understanding God's great plan for marriage, how wonderful and good and whole this relationship is meant to be. It's about taking a good marriage and making it great. It's about leaving with hope and a plan for the future. Come and experience a weekend getaway. It's so much more than a conference. Family Life, help for today, hope for tomorrow. And Corinne is going to come at this time and tell you about a new initiative and also the Family Life Conference. So if you have any questions about the marriage conference, please come and talk to me. I have attended one, and it's a great time to get away and invest in your marriage. So we have a new initiative called Go Fresh. Doesn't that sound good? You want to go fresh? We want to go fresh, and we're hoping that you're going to join us as we go fresh and help our community. As you all know, the cost of living is continuing to rise. Our food prices, our power bills, gas, uh, and, and people are finding it very difficult to make ends meet. And you may have uh, seen on Facebook, uh, the Valley Food Bank posted March 2023 and March 2024 in the numbers. And there's a hundred more people that went to the food bank this March as opposed to last March. And they gave out 9,000 more pounds of food. So the need is great. And so we as a church want to be able to help our community and be involved and meet the needs that are there. And so we wanted to go fresh and we're excited because we want to partner two different organizations in Woodstock. Community Food Smart is a group of people that um, come together and buy fresh produce at, in bulk so that it's more affordable. And they actually make up a bag of fresh produce once a month on a Tuesday. And some of you may know, you may purchase one of those bags, that they actually put them together here at the church and people come and pick up their bags. So it's a great, uh, there's a picture there of what comes in the bag for $15. So we want to partner and purchase, we're hoping to, buy 12 bags a month for the food bank as a church body. And uh, active in mission, many of you were involved in either giving or walking, running, or biking um, last year for active in mission uh, through a CBM, they have given us a grant to get our initiative started. And so we're going to buy 12 bags of fresh produce from Community Food Smart uh, for April, May, June, and July. And then we're hoping that you will get involved in this project with us. And if you think you can, you can purchase or donate money to purchase a bag for $15, and you can donate in your regular giving and just mark it, go fresh. Or if you thought, I think I can uh, support that and buy and pay for one bag for all 12 months till next July 2025, you can make a donation of $180, and that will buy one bag each month. And so we're hoping that you will join us in the initiative to go fresh and help provide fresh produce for those in need in our community and be the church and meet those needs. And also, I would say the Valley Food Bank is always in need of volunteers. So if you have a few hours uh, on a weekly basis that you would like to go and help, they'd love to help your help. And so if you're interested in that, please contact me and I'll make sure you get in touch with Monica. So thank you. And please join us as we go fresh. All right, and our call to worship this morning is found in Psalm 145 and verse 3, where it says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Our God is great and he is worthy of all of our praise. So let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Father, we are so thankful for your greatness this morning. And you are worthy of all of our praise. And so, Father, as we enter into worship, as we sing this morning, we pray, Lord, that we would just sing of your greatness. And, Father, may we be drawn into a deep, close, personal, and intimate relationship with you. Father, may we just sense your presence in this place today. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning to each of you, and for those of you online, will you please stand with us? We're going to start by singing How Great is Our God together. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. All the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in white, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice, how great. to uh, sing is crown him with many crowns and um, I like to look at where songs come from and and this one is quite an old hymn but this is written about it crowns are more than decorative headwear reserved for royalty they signify honor power and dominion for the king of kings a single crown could never suffice to represent his infinite glory and authority and so we crown him with many crowns as we lift up, lift up our voices to praise the one exalted high above all others. This beloved hymn magnifies Jesus, the Lord over all creation, who is deserving of every crown. The lyricist beautifully captures just some of the many facets of our Savior's majesty that demand our worship. As we sing, we join the eternal chorus around God's throne. 
proclaiming the wonder of who Christ is and what he has done. This rich imagery stirs our hearts to offer him every crown for no earthly treasure compares to him. just going to share this scripture for it with you before we um, worship by singing do it again um, Paul was writing in 2nd Corinthians to the Corinthian church and I just got to switch this because I can't see <laughs> and he said this in 2nd Corinthians chapter 1 verses 8 to 10 brothers and sisters we want you to know about the trouble that we suffered in Asia. We had great burdens there that were beyond our own strength. Sounds like some of us, eh? We even gave up hope of living. Truly in our own hearts we believed we would die. But this happened so we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises people from the dead. God saved us from these great dangers of death, and he will continue to save us. We have put our hope in him, and he will save us again. No. 
I tried to make this better It didn't go so well Sometimes in life I can't make right all by myself Seems like an uphill battle Feels like it's just no fear Some things in life I can't make right But even then I gotta let go Let God put me back together I don't think I can live like this forever I've only got two hands I can't hold the world But he can I know I've got to let go and let God. Why don't I just surrender? I run from it every time. Don't I believe he's all I need even when I feel like I'm treading water fighting for every breath. Don't I believe he's all I need. He'll give me rest when I let go, let God put me back together. I don't think I can live like this forever. I've only got two hands. I can hold the world, but he can't. I know I've got to let go and let God be my peace, be my peace, be my healing. Let God be my joy, be my life, be my freedom. Oh God, you're my rest, you're my peace, you're my healing. My God, you're my joy, you're my life. God put me back together. I don't think I can live like this forever. I've only got two hands. I can't hold the world, but he can. I know I've got to let go and let God. I know I've got to let go and let God let go and let God Thank you, Steve. All right, we are going to unite our hearts in prayer, so would you pray with me? Dear God, we want to uh, give you praise, Father, and sometimes it's hard to give you praise just because you're so, so great when we are not. And Lord, we want to just praise you even though, God, on this day, and we thank you that we've sung of your greatness already. Father, thank you that your greatness is so great because of what you did through the Easter season, through what we just celebrated, Father. And we thank you that Jesus died and he rose again to give us life and life to the fullest and, and the salvation that we need, Father. And so we, we praise you for that on this day. God, as we have lived and as we have come to church this morning, as we've lived in this past week, uh, some of us may have had a very difficult week. Some of us have maybe had a really uh, terrible morning, Father. And we want to acknowledge that on, uh, on today, Father. And we know that there are many things that bring us down, Lord, in this life. And so we want to surrender them to you, Father. We want to let go of them now. And I pray that you would help us to take on your burden of light on this day. God, we recognize that situations can be dark, 
uh, and we can feel far away from you, Lord, but we want to praise you and, and thank you and proclaim on this day that nothing can separate us from you, God. There's nothing, there's no darkness, there is no uh, sickness, there is no wound that can separate us from you, God, and we thank you and we praise you for that, God. We thank you that there is no uh, hopeless situation, there is no illness, there is no mental health that can separate us from you, God. And so we ask, Father, on this day that you would remind us of who you are, Father, in our situation. May we experience you in this church today, Father, we ask. Father, we pray for those who may be overcome with sickness or disease. God, would you, pr would you heal them, Father? We pray for them. God, we also want to pray for those who may be far off. Lord, who we pray for weekly or daily, Father, that they would know you, Father, that they would turn from their ways, that they would uh, acknowledge you as their Lord and Savior of, of their life, Father. And we want to pray for them, Father. May, they, may you comfort them, be with them on this day, and would you reveal yourself to them, Lord. We pray for those who may be traveling, who may be preparing for a trip in the coming future, Father, or are on the roads this today, Lord. May you protect them and guide them and help them to know that you, Father, are not just the God of, of Woodstock Baptist. You're not just the God of New Brunswick, but you are the God of this whole world. And your greatness fulfills and is over this, whole, this entire country and this entire nation and this entire world. And Father, we thank you that your greatness has no bounds. Lord, we thank you for the different ministries and the different opportunities we have to share of your greatness. Father, we thank you uh, for the Go Fresh initiative as well that Corrine mentioned this morning. We thank you for the children's ministries and the opportunities to uh, minister into children's lives, teenagers' lives, Father, and uh, even uh, we think of family lives as well and even uh, uh, seniors as well, Father. We thank you for opportunities to speak and that you are the God of all ages as well. And so, Father, we, we, we praise you on this day. And, God, we just ask that you would meet us where we're at today. Lord, we thank you that, again, nothing can separate us from your love. God, may we experience your love on this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 20. So if you want to turn to your Bibles there. We're reading John chapter 20, and we're going to be reading verses 24 through 20 or 31. So John 20 says this. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not, the, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, Lord, am I God? Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Thank you, Keegan, Steve, and our worship team this morning. We're just about finished our sermon series that we began back in September, Hopeful Life Encounters. We're here this morning and again next Sunday, and then we will move on to a brand new sermon series. This morning I've entitled the message, 
in this series, Hopeful Life Encounters, I've entitled it, The Wounded Healer. And last Sunday, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the cornerstone of our faith, and it's the crowning proof that Jesus defeated death. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who participated. If you were here, you know that we were a packed house, and I want to say thank you to our ministry team and our decorators and all of those who worked on our set and design and our worship team and tech team, our soloists, our actors, our drama team, all those that were involved in food prep and serving and sweetening, sweetening us up with all of those sweet treats to our greeters and those who served in the cafe, um, our welcome team, um, everybody that served last week. We just want to say thank you and I want to say thank you for serving the Lord with with excellence. And so thank you. To set the context for what I want to talk to us about today, I want to begin in Matthew chapter 28. And several times throughout the New Testament, we have what theologians call the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus uh, before he ascends into heaven. And the reality is, after Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus appeared to people. He appeared to the women near the tomb. He appeared to the two men on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to 10 of the disciples. He appeared to 500 of the brethren. He took the disciples on a fishing trip. He cooked them breakfast on the beach. Uh, he took them up into a mountain. And in Matthew chapter 28, the disciples were on a mountain before Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. And if you're not familiar with what the ascension is, it's when Jesus ascended into the cloud and on up into heaven, which would have been absolutely amazing to see. And you can read it in Acts chapter 1 and verses 9 through 11, where it says, He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This is the same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven. He will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And so before Jesus ascends up into the clouds, before he ascends and goes up into heaven, Jesus in Matthew chapter 28 gives the disciples a final assignment. It's called the Great Commission. And Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So what Jesus gives his disciples in his final instructions as they're up here on this mountain is he says, you know, go and tell the whole world. Go and tell the whole world what has just happened. Tell them about the Son of God who was without sin, who became sin for us, who died on the cross, who was raised from the dead, so that anyone who knows him and believes in him will be forgiven and their lives will be transformed. The message of Jesus was go and tell the whole world. Matthew chapter 28 is a chapter that's full of action, and it gets a lot of focus at the very beginning of the, the chapter. There's a lot of focus at the very end of the chapter, but there's some information in the middle that sometimes we tend to avoid because we're either focusing on the resurrection, which we read about at the very first part of the chapter, or we're focusing on the Great Commission, go and tell the whole world. But the first part of but the middle part, there's something that I really want us to see this morning that quite often we, we miss. And if we look at verses 16 and 17, it says this. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. So they've gone here at Jesus' direction. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But what's the very next thing you read? 
But some, some doubted. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. According to Matthew, the climax of the gospel is the 11 disciples heading to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. They gathered here in this place because Jesus told them to go here. And Jesus is there when they arrive. And when some saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. You know, there's a strange thing about the human nature. And often we are encouraged when we see someone else going through a challenging thing. Because we realize, you know what? I'm not alone. A few Sundays ago, I shared with you about our microwave washer and my broken wisdom tooth all within a matter of three or four hours. The comment was made, I'm glad I'm not the only one that faces some challenges. And so you know what that's saying is sometimes in a strange way, we feel good when we see others going through some challenging things because we realize that we're not alone. Guess what? Pastors have problems just like everyone else and things break down and uh, things fall apart just like everyone else has those experiences in their life. There's something strangely comforting to us as humans when we hear about what other people are going through in their life because it brings a connection and we can identify with the challenges that they are going through. And when I read Matthew chapter 28 and I read about the disciples meeting Jesus on this mountain and I read that you know, here they are, they're seeing him face to face, and some worshipped, but there were some who, who doubted. What does that do to my heart? What does that do to my life? You know, I can find myself thinking, I wish I was there. I wish that I'd have had that experience. But some of the disciples who were there and saw Jesus face to face, they doubted. The Greek word for doubt here has some subtle overtones. Life, but to have doubts and to admit them openly within the church or within Christian circles sometimes is a really scary experience. It can be scary and you want to ask questions, but sometimes you wonder, am I the only one? Am I the only one wrestling with doubt? And if I ask this question that I've got bouncing around in my mind, then what will they think of me? You might want to ask the question, and yet guilt and shame prevent you from asking the question. Craig Rochelle said this. He said, I'm convinced just in my pastoral tenure that some people are leaving the church not because God isn't good, but because they have questions they don't feel safe asking. And I'm convinced that some people don't feel like they can safely express their doubts. Do you ever battle doubts? Why do we doubt? I think one of the primary reasons that we will doubt in life is when we find ourselves in a period of time or a season of life in which we are experiencing great pain. And whether it's pain in your own life or the pain that you see in someone else's life or the pain that you see happening in the world around us, we begin to think, well, where is God? And we begin to think, 
what's going on here? How does a good God allow this to happen? And so those doubts begin to infiltrate our hearts and our minds. Think about some painful things I have prayed about every day of my life for a long time, and yet still unresolved. And I think, God, I know you're here, and I know you're good, and I know you can answer, and I know you can fix this, but I am still, I am still waiting. Do you have any situations in your life for which you are still waiting, God, to answer? And sometimes doubt can begin to creep into your head and into your heart. Maybe you look at the pain around the world and you see innocent people who are suffering in places like the Middle East, Ukraine, and Haiti, just to name a few places. And it can cause some doubt. Or you see the pain within our own country. People are working and yet struggling to put food on the table and keep the light and the heat on because the cost of living, as you've heard already this morning, is going through the roof. And you wonder, where in the world is God? And sometimes it's because there are hurts that you cannot resolve. Maybe you looked up to someone and how they were uh, a Christian and they did something horrible or you felt like the church wasn't a safe place and then unfortunately it wasn't as safe as you thought and so you got really hurt and you got really burned. And so you begin to doubt and you begin to wrestle. And then there are sometimes, there are Christians who make it really difficult. They're really legalistic. And people don't feel safe because it's a my way or the highway approach. Our world is really complicated. And I want you to know today that if you have doubts, there is a way to handle your doubts properly. Your doubts, believe it or not, can actually draw you closer to God. Because it's so important to understand that your faith is a journey and not a destination. Do you ever arrive at faith? Like, you know, I've got my masters of faith. Anybody there? Anyone willing to admit that? I think we're continually and we are constantly growing in our faith, are we not? Parents, don't be surprised if your kids ask some questions. Allow them to ask those questions about faith. Give them space to ask those hard questions. The questions are not a time to panic. It's a time to process. It's a time to allow them to talk. It's a time for them to have a thinking faith and to allow faith become their own as God works that in them and through them and out through them in their life. The strongest faith is not a faith that never doubts. The strongest faith is one that grows through your doubts. Amen? Take, for example, Thomas. Thomas in the Bible after the resurrection, you know, this is the big doubt story in the scriptures in the New Testament. Um, It's an account involving one of the disciples who has forever been known as Doubting Thomas, and he gets a really bad rap in Scripture. And on Easter evening, we know from last Sunday morning that Jesus appeared to the disciples, but Thomas wasn't present. He wasn't there, and he was absent. And so this is what I want you to see in our first point this morning. That, you know, there are times in life when we go through hurt and when we go through pain and maybe we're doubting and we're struggling and we're wrestling in those moments and just like, you know, in the song that Steve sang this morning, you know, we feel like we're treading water and we're, we're just trying to keep our head above the water because of the situation we're in, because of the pain we're experiencing and you're in a hurt place and God wants to heal you and you need healing. And so healing begins in an unexpected place. Healing can begin in the valley 
of doubt. And one of the things that can cause us to doubt is a wounded soul. Thomas is a hurting person with a wounded soul. And before you pass harsh judgments on him, I want to give you the raw details of what brought him to this valley of doubt. Thomas is a disappointed man. His hope has been dashed, and when his, this kind of disappointment comes, it turns everything upside down, your past, your present, and your future. If you've ever had your heart broken by someone you loved, or had a hero of yours proved to be a fraud, you know the feeling that I'm talking about. It's like getting kicked in the stomach. And I wonder if that's how Thomas and the rest of Jesus' followers felt on Friday after the, after the crucifixion of Jesus. I think Thomas, like the rest of the crew, felt this was the end. Jesus' lifeless body has been wrapped in a tomb. They would never see him again. They would never share the joy of Jesus' friendship again. They were left with the vivid memory of his humiliation, his suffering, and his defeat at the hands of angry enemies. Every hope that had grown up in their souls over the previous his three years of ministry with him was completely dashed. You know, one week they're singing Hosanna, and the next week they're crying, crucify him. And he's just filled with grief, and he's overwhelmed. But Jesus was alive. And in verse 19 and 20 of John chapter 20, it says, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the, lo saw the Lord. But Thomas wasn't there. Verse 24, it says, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And in verse 24 and 25, the other disciples told him, Look, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And the way this is written in the Greek, it says that, you know, it probably was repeated over and over and over again. We've seen the Lord. 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 And over and over they would have said this. But Thomas replies, mm -mm. I won't believe unless I see the nails, nail wounds in his hands. I won't believe unless I put my fingers in them. I won't believe unless I place my hand into the wound in his side. And in the original Greek, this is a very emphatic form of, I will not believe. And that is the reason that Thomas is known as Doubting Thomas. And Thomas has had this reputation for a long time. Thomas just really wanted to know. Thomas had doubt. And Thomas, I just really want to know. I'm not going to believe unless I, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side. I will not believe. Oswald Chambers said this, doubt is not always a sign that a man is wrong. It may be a sign that he is thinking. And your doubts do not disqualify your faith. Thomas gets a bad rap. But I think Thomas has a deep faith. If you go over to John chapter 11 where Lazarus died, he's been dead for four days. And we know that in the King James Version it says that he stinketh. So putting that into modern day language, he's stinky. And four days later Thomas went to Jesus and Jesus says, let's go to him. And then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, hey, let's go, that we may die with Jesus. Is that a lack of, is that fear? Is that courage? He says, let's, uh, let's go back to, to Judea. And the disciples a short while ago raised the issue that the Jews there had tried to, to kill you. And you're going to go back? And Thomas says, look, if Jesus is going back, let's go back with him. You know, we'll, we'll die with him. Then there's that other story in John chapter 14, where Jesus tells the disciples that he's leaving them and he's, he's going to 
and he doesn't want their hearts to be troubled. And he says, I'm going back to heaven. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, you know, I'm, I'm going to come back and get you so that you can come be with me where I am. And Thomas says, Lord, where are you going? Lord, how can we know the way? And I'm so glad he asked that question. He asked the question that everybody else in the room was thinking but maybe too afraid to ask. And Jesus gives that answer. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. I'm glad he asked the question. Because look at the answer. A few years ago, <clears throat> I wrote a research paper for a course that I was taking called Reaching and Retaining Young Adults. And one of the primary reasons that young adults leave the faith, many of them grew up in fundamental evangelical homes, but they were raised in homes where asking questions about the faith was taboo. And so when they grew up and they got out on their own, they just, they were just gone because faith they weren't given that space where they could ask those questions about who Jesus is and about creation and all of those things that they wonder about. And parents, if kids ask questions, don't panic. Process. You don't have to have all of the answers, but give them that space where they can ask the things that they are wondering about. Give them that safe place where they can ask those questions about the things that are troubling their soul. So here we are, eight days later, Thomas shows up, even in the middle of his doubts, and, you know, he wanted proof. Uh, Jesus is risen? Well, how do I know he's risen? I'm not believing unless I what? Unless I see and unless I touch. Thomas is hurting. He feels alone. He feels betrayed. He feels like his hopes are crushed. He's heard the disciples saying, look, we've seen the Lord. He's alive. And Thomas in his hurt, he's got all of these doubts that are racing through his head. But the thing we see in Thomas's doubt is that Thomas is open to belief, isn't he? He's open to the evidence. <laughs> I want to see. I want to touch. You see, the journey to healing sometimes passes through the valley of doubt. And if you find yourself in the valley of doubt, it's faith that will see you through the valley. See, how... Healing passes through the valley of doubt, but healing passes through a place of searching and the quest for peace. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. How does Jesus respond to this doubter? Does he respond to him in harsh judgment? How does Jesus respond? Does Jesus belittle him for his doubt? He greeted Thomas in the most kind way possible. And he said, peace be with you. Has Thomas been at peace? I don't think so. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach your hand out. Put it into my side. I love the Lord's gentle approach. And then one moment he's in a place of doubt and he's doubting. And in the very next moment, where is he? He's crying out, my Lord and my God. What's happened? What's happened to all of his doubt? What's happened to all of his fear? He knows, doesn't he? He knows. Does the Lord stand off when we're doubting? 
I think the Lord moves to us and he's willing for us to touch him in the midst of our doubt. That's how personal he is. Thomas asked questions because he needed to. And Thomas comes out of this with a solid faith. And if tradition tells us the end of Thomas's story, that he actually became a martyr for faith and died in the year 72 as he'd taken the gospel to new frontiers, and it's believed that he died as a martyr in India for taking his faith. What happened as he processed his doubt and he moved through the valley of doubt? God solidified in his heart and his mind truth. And his life was changed. And he went all the way, making the ultimate sacrifice for Jesus. If you have doubt, come to Jesus. Because healing is centered in Jesus. He is the wounded healer. Reach your finger here. See my hands. Reach here. Put your hand here. Put it into my side. The Lord met Thomas at the point of his weakness and doubt without rebuke because he knew Thomas's doubt And he wanted Thomas to work through this. And in a moment, his hurting is healed. His wounded soul is healed. Wren Collective wrote a song, Nailed to the Cross, and in it is a line, My soul has been healed by the scars. And this morning, maybe you've got some deep wounds. Maybe you've got some deep pain. Maybe you've got some scars. And in your hurt and in your pain, you are really wrestling with doubt. I want you to know that there is a Savior who has been wounded on your behalf so that you can be healed. And he reveals his scars. He doesn't hide them. So often we want to hide our scars. When if we want to become wounded healers as Jesus is, we're willing to bear our scars and show and reveal how God has healed hurt in our own life. Because the scars are a testimony of God's power and his ability to be able to heal. Amen. Jesus stood among them. He said, peace be to you. Thomas, put your finger here. Stop doubting. Believe. And Thomas says, my Lord, my God, Jesus is here. Jesus wants to heal you. He is the wounded healer. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. The road to belief, the road to trust, The journey to experience a healing of heart, mind, and soul often begins in a place of doubt. While we're in that valley, remember that faith is the means to push through. Where you decide you are not going to stay there, you are going to seek so that you can find the answers to your doubt. Taking a deep look beneath the surface of our lives to find out why we're feeling the way we are and seek the prescription that the Lord offers for healing our wounds. We will trust in the Lord and not lean on our own understanding. And doubts are always followed by discoveries. Jesus said, reach out your hand, touch my side, stop doubting and believe. And then he leaves us with these words, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Father, We come to you this morning and we say thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus, to be the wounded healer. We're thankful, God, that because Jesus came, he has the ability to heal our wounds. Father, we all have hurt. We all have pain. We all have sorrow and grief that's built up inside us that at times the enemy will use to to create and sow all kinds of havoc and within our lives. So Lord, as, as we wrestle with those doubts, may we just come to you over and over and over and over again. May we keep bringing them to you. And may we allow you to touch those unhealed parts of our life and bring the healing that we so desperately need. 
Father, when we know and believe that you're alive and and we have that settled in our hearts and in our minds, we know that you deserve our life, our all, and all that we have. And so, Lord, we thank you for the example of Thomas, and we're thankful that he was real. And we're thankful, Lord, for how that you met him in that place of doubt, and you brought the healing to his life that his heart so desperately needed. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table, if you did not receive communion, if you did not receive the bread and the cup, we have some ushers who will bring that to you. Just raise your hand. And I want to read... from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 18 and 19 where it says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Communion is a, is a time to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. You know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish and defect. And so when we think about communion, you know, the dictionary would define communion as close relationship with someone in which feelings and thoughts are exchanged. And so there's a sense in which as we come before the Lord's table this morning in communion, we are in relationship with him if we know him as our Lord and Savior. And if we're in relationship with him, he invites us to partake of the bread and the cup, which are reminders of the great sacrifice that he made on our behalf. His body was broken, his life's blood was given so that we could be forgiven and so that our sins could be removed from us as far as the east is from the west. And as we come to the Lord's table, this is also a time in which we do a heart check. Listen to this. In verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. And so this morning, as we partake of communion, would you examine your heart? Would you examine your life before the Lord? And uh, let's just have a moment of quietness and search your heart and ask the Lord to seek your, seek your heart. And then I will lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving for the bread and the cup.
Father, we come to you this morning and we give thanks for the symbol of the bread and your broken body. We come before you this morning and we give thanks for the symbol of the cup and your blood which was shed on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, that your body was broken, that your blood was shed, so that we can experience forgiveness of sin. Father, we recognize today that we have not been redeemed by, with perishable things, but by your blood. And so we give thanks today for what you have done on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. I'll ask you to stand with us. We'll sing about that wounded one, the lamb who is so worthy of our praises and our thanksgiving. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you See it all. 
Father, worthy is the Lamb to think that the darling of heaven was crucified. Crucified on our behalf to set us free from sin and sin's punishment. Thankful, Lord, the Savior who is crucified is alive that the tomb is empty. And the message of the resurrection can change our life in the here and now and forevermore. Thank you, God, for who you are, for meeting us where we are, even in the middle of our doubt, giving us what we need to lead us onward, forward, and upward. In Jesus' name, amen. We do thank you for being with us this morning and worshiping. May God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you.